Okay, well, thank you very much, Graham, for that uh, little tidbit at the start. So, yes, that's my passion outside of science. Uh, and I'd have to say there's a, quite a bit of science in aviculture as well. Uh, Peter's already mentioned a couple of things that I was going to touch on. And uh, earlier in the day, Andrew gave us a, a great talk about uh, analytics and how we can extract as much information as possible from the information we already have. I guess what I'm going to talk about is how technology might help us get more information, better quality information to help us in real time make better decisions. And that's where I think technology can come together with people. But I wanted to start by just reminding us that biosecurity is both an outcome that we're trying to achieve and a system, a system of protocols and regulations and legislation, collaborations, and importantly, it's a human system. It's driven by people, uh, it's designed by people, and very often stuffed up by people. And so if we forget the human dimension of biosecurity, then we're missing a big part. And we've heard a lot today about how we can mobilise people as part of a, a better response to biosecurity. If we think about the biosecurity system, and I've got there one big island, but we could have a couple of smaller islands the same issues apply, that we're trying to understand risk offshore, understand pathways that bring threats to our border, understand how we can stop them at the border, hopefully, but then if they do come on shore, how do they establish, spread, have impact, what do we do about it? And importantly, how do we support our industries to achieve market access in the face of continuous pest uh, pressures that might be endemic but might well be exotics? So where along that continuum might we see technologies uh, help in improving the biosecurity system? And I think we could say anywhere. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, four areas of technology. I want to talk a bit about autonomous platforms for surveillance. I want to talk a bit about sensors and sensor networks, a bit about new genetic technologies, and there's a raft of them. And I want to talk a bit about social media and where that plays into biosecurity. And I've only got a few minutes, but in saying that I want to talk about all those areas of, uh, of technology, I don't want to miss the human dimension. We really need to be thinking about how we activate, engage and educate people to minimise the risk to our systems and participate in delivering better outcomes. And citizen science is one way that we can do that but uh, all sorts of education processes that lift the awareness are critically important. So I'll come back to the human dimension right at the end. But in terms of autonomous surveillance platforms, I think we're seeing a, a real revolution in the capacity of, uh, of systems like these. Two examples shown there, a Starbug, a small uh, submarine that can be fitted with a raft of sensors and uh, We'd like to see some pilot studies done to use something like Starbug as a 24-7 surveillance platform in our harbours, supporting the marine biosecurity outcomes that we need to achieve, which is a huge vulnerability for us and probably for yourselves. Things like fully autonomous little helicopters there that have been used for surveillance of invasive weeds in rainforests where it's too dangerous to use manned helicopters and they tend to crash. So two examples there. Smart trapping, uh, we're developing some automated trapping systems for fruit fly that uh, you will certainly hear about under the logo of Rapid Aim. But real-time detection systems that give you instantaneous information about a, a capture. So really speeding up the potential to respond. And I'll, again, I'll come back to that example because the innovation here is not in a smart trap, it's in what you do with it. If we think about uh, the second area of smart sensors and, uh, and sensor networks, just imagine if every one of those containers on that ship had a cheap ENO sensor built into it that travelled with the container everywhere it went. And when you got to a port, it downloaded what it had detected. We think that can be done for a few dollars a container. Every container in the globe in 20 years might have an inbuilt sensor like that. I think that's part of the dreaming that uh, Sir Ray asked us to do uh, earlier. 
But think about fully sensorised ports, fully sensorised agricultural landscapes or particular parts of the environment that we might want to capture information about not what's there but what is unusual. So sensors that pick up difference, things that scan the environment and say, well, this is the environment I know, and then next week it scans the environment and says there's something different. That might be enough to trigger us to respond. But think about those opportunities in terms of smart sensors. Small, inexpensive, wirelessly connected sensors are available now and can be implemented for specific applications. But getting to the, the multimodal applications that uh, Peter talked about is perhaps the next step, but that's where we need to be heading. <coughs> Imagine if we had a genome sensor, something that not only collected something physical but could capture the, the genetic information of an organism, sequenced it and gave us an answer. Think about a little genome sensor that lived in the ballast water of a ship and when it got to port it downloaded to you and said here's the risks, or before it got to port hopefully. These things, and you can see genome sensors, two big ones there, they're not yet at the stage where they're a little pocket book size device, but those things are coming. We will have USB genome sensors, we will have mobile phones that can be used for genome sensing. A few years off yet, but they're the possibilities. If we move into advanced genetic technologies, there's a raft of opportunities, and I haven't got time to talk about them all. RNAi is something that we've worked uh, extensively with, all sorts of applications in genomics and precision genome engineering, and obviously now using things like CRISPR-Cas9, driving genetic change into populations so that we can manage populations more effectively using gene drives. We've used whole genome sequencing, which is now feasible, and inexpensive with next-gen sequencing technologies to rapidly characterise organisms that we really didn't know too much about before that helps us discriminate what are pests and what are not, how are they related. It's feasible to do this very rapidly. We've been applying it to whitefly. We can use the same technologies to look at what, what are these organisms carrying, what are the, uh, the hitchhikers that come with them, discovering a, a whole class of of bacteria carried in a what was previously a cryptic species of cryptolestes, a class of bacteria that have uh, negative impacts on rice. We wouldn't have been able to do that without whole genome sequencing telling us not just the insect but everything that comes with it. And we've been adopting, using these technologies, an approach of really focusing on genes of biosecurity significance, not just organisms. We want to be tracking resistance genes or, or genes for particular traits that have negative impacts in our agriculture and mapping those pathways. And we've been applying that in particular to Helicoverpa armidra, uh, the species that I've worked on for many, many years in Australia, but which recently invaded Brazil. And we were able to apply techniques to tell Brazil where their armidra came from, in China, precisely where. Uh, it didn't come from us. But that's the sort of thing we can do. We also recently applied the same technologies to understanding how Australia got two new insecticide resistances in green peach aphid. We found that in France the same thing happened at about exactly the same time and using whole genome sequencing we were able to track back to show that although we've had green peach aphid for decades in Australia, so it's a, an exotic but not a new incursion, we have had a new incursion that's brought these two new resistances that have, have had significant impact on our canola cropping systems. We can demonstrate that yes, that is a new incursion and we can demonstrate where it came from and France got it at the same time from the same place. So they're the sorts of things we can do with some of those technologies. We're really interested right now in how to apply some of these technologies to really intractable invasive species. You all know about our cane toad story. Well, that's one of the things that we've been trying to work on for a, a long time. But the real challenge of how we identify a negative trait that we might, might want to use to manage an invasive species, how do we drive it into a population when it's going to have a deleterious effect on an individual? Well, that's the opportunity that comes now with the various gene drive technologies available, but particularly based on CRISPR-Cas9. But being able to intentionally drive 
deleterious changes into a population, not, ne not, necessarily, not necessarily mortality, but changes that change the capacity of that invasive species to have negative impact. So, for example, with uh, cane toad, we've got a project now looking at driving a change into that population that blocks their capacity to produce the toxin they produce, which is how they have the main impact they do on biodiversity. If we can spread that into the population, cane toads suddenly become prey in the Australian environment and we should see them suppressed. So they're the sorts of things we can think about. Natural gene drive mechanisms based on Wolbachia, and I know many of you may not be aware of Wolbachia, but it's a, a microorganism that has a symbiotic or commensal relationship with lots of insects. But Wolbachia can change a lot of the genetic traits of, of insects. And you can hitch things with Wolbachia to make specific changes. We're doing work net right now with that approach with mosquitoes, looking at a gene drive approach to give us a barrier to the potential invasion of Asian tiger mosquito into northern Australia. But the, the real uh, revolution is in RNA-guided gene drives, um, the potential to drive specific small changes into populations. And the amazing capacity of, of these to uh, make themselves homozygous in whatever background they find themselves, but still be contained within a species. So real opportunities is, and I think the point that Peter raised though about social license is really emerging with this sort of technology, is how you, uh, you get agreement and approval to use it. It's going beyond the arguments about GMOs to very precise changes that can be made species specific. And we see real application for these sorts of gene drive technologies. I want to finish then just on well, two more uh, cases, social media and biosecurity. Obviously, social media is now a vast uh, zoo of information. Some of it useful, some of it crap. All sorts of platforms. And we can harvest information in both passive and active forms. We can be encouraging people to be contributing biosecurity relevant information in an active phase. But you can also harvest information flows in social media for passive surveillance. And there's a great example happening uh, in Australia already in harvesting the Twitter sphere. CSIRO has the, uh, I guess, the honour of har we harvest every tweet that happens in Australia and in Indonesia. And that information is already being searched for key words that pop up in the Twitter sphere that might be signalling an emergency outbreak of some sort or an emergency event. And so emergency services in Australia are already using these tools. We're exploring whether we can use the same tools of tr trolling through the Twitter sphere, looking at very early biosecurity signals that tell us that there's something going on. Communication between a couple of farmers, for example. So just an example there. But I wanted to finish with uh, just getting us to think more broadly about innovation in biosecurity delivery. Uh, biosecurity is often seen as a government responsibility. Governments provide a series of services that constrain, control, regulate and lead to a biosecurity outcome, which everybody is very grateful for. But we think there's real scope to apply the innovation thinking that's dominant in Australia at the moment and I think here as well to look at business opportunities in biosecurity delivery. Look at where small to medium enterprises might uh, really change the way biosecurity services are delivered and make dollars out of it. Um, in some cases it might require government to let go a little of the reins and be willing to accept that businesses can collect, deliver a service and it can be just as legitimate as if the government was doing it but there's innovation in how that, that can happen. And when you look at investors and them looking at an opportunity, they're often going to see that the, the business opportunity is not in the widget. It's not in the smart trap, for example. It's in the information, the integrated information that you can gather. And that's exactly what RapidAim, for example, is doing. RapidAim is not going to be selling smart traps. It's going to be collecting, integrating and selling information that makes a difference in biosecurity response. So 
I think we need more of that sort of thinking as we get plans like yours, which I think is fantastic, uh, get them imp implemented and get community and innovation fully engaged. A few uh, things to, to test there. We first have to be sure that customers are really willing to pay for these services, but if the value can be demonstrated to be there, uh, then we think there's a, a real opportunity to create an environment that enables and supports both agricultural industries, aquatic industries, marine industries, trade, uh, but with innovative businesses finding an opportunity around information. So that's all I was going to say as a starter. Thanks.